and we have a, a superb, um, a superbly qualified person here to talk about all these things. Uh, Dr. Gilden is a, is a former vice president of the World Bank. Uh, he's an expert on many different things. He's written 12 different books on subjects as diverse as migration, globalization, sustainable development. The list goes on and on. And um, most importantly of all, he is um, the director of the Martin School at Oxford, which is a really fascinating research centre, bringing together interesting multidisciplinary teams of researchers and with a focus, an important focus on the challenges of the future, which I think is a really interesting and novel development. And um, he's going to um, take us through um, some of the things that he's working on. He's going to give us a smorgasbord of different issues to think about. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to have some time for a discussion and some questions and answers. So without any further ado, um, Dr. Gilder, a great pleasure to have you here this evening. Over to you. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, and it's a tremendous opportunity to be engaged with policy exchange and to be able to talk with people that care about uh, public policy. That's one of the things that are on my mind uh, and on the minds of colleagues uh, in Oxford. The Oxford Martin School now embraces 30 different research groups across Oxford University, uh, all of them intent on developing new thinking in interdisciplinary ways uh, on the big challenges of the future. And a common theme to emerge from this research, and we've, the startup we've been going four years, so the research is just beginning to emerge, is that uh, societies around the world uh, are not ready for the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, what I'll do is provide you some perspectives on why this is the case, and hope in conversation you can encourage me to think that I'm wrong. Uh, and uh, but actually there's all sorts of things happening in government and in think tanks uh, that are taking on board uh, these challenges. So I hope I'm wrong. Uh, I fear that uh, we might uh, find rather than I'm underestimating the challenges, you load on me challenges I haven't thought of, and I'll just provide some sample of this. The thing about thinking about the future, of course, the thing about thinking about the future is that we know that the best minds uh, in the best institutions habitually uh, get the future wrong. And uh, this is not only true of the best and biggest firms or pundits, uh, it's certainly true as well of the big global institutions, including those institutions that I've been closely associated with, with like the IMF um, and the World Bank. So we shouldn't feel bad, and we shouldn't create an expectation in society that somehow we're going to be able to predict the future, that we're going to be able to tell society what's coming around the corner, uh, because if we do that, we will be stepping into extremely hazardous territory, uh, and we will be in very good company with the likes of the best intelligence agencies and the Bill Gateses of this world and the best economic management institutions if we get the future wrong. But what can we hope to do, and how can we? We can, I think, hope to understand what the major trends are, the mega trends. Uh, and we can create the future. So the surest way to manage the future and to ensure predictability is to have a very big say in the creation of it. Uh, and so being a driving force and not only reactive uh, in this process is extremely important. What we've learned from the financial crisis, and I'll come back to this because I think it really is quite fundamental, uh, is that even the best placed of the global institutions and national institutions got it hopelessly wrong. Uh, we know, am I stepping on toes if I say we know that in the UK, say, the Bank of England and the Treasury uh, have the best resource base and they attract the most skilled uh, graduates uh, of the different departments. Uh, it's certainly true at the global level where the IMF, for example, and the World Bank, uh, the IS are the most competitive institutions to get into. Uh, and we have over 20,000 PhDs from broken institutions who were trying to understand and prevent the next global crisis, but none of them saw the crisis coming. Uh, and so I think we should feel that if they can't do it, is where are the next crises coming from? What do we do about that? And what about other areas where we have even less capability and resources focused on the problems? So this is the sorts of challenges uh, that I'm grappling with. And they become much more acute in this particular period we're in because 
we're going through a period of turbocharged globalization. This is a tidal wave of globalization that we are currently engulfed in. We might not see it because we're immersed in it, uh, but it's certainly a period of history which is extremely unusual and the public policy challenges in this period are very different, substantively different, to public policy challenges faced in periods before. Now, I know that politicians always like to say this time is different um, and that the world has faced challenges before, but I really do believe that the nature of the national and global policy challenges are totally different to those even 20 years ago. What happened 20 years ago? The Berlin Wall came down, Europe integrated the 92 Maastricht Treaty, uh, North America NAFTA integration, 64 countries democratized over the last 20 years. Uh, China opened up. Trade barriers are about half on average of the level they were uh, 20 years ago. Capital accounts have generally been liberalized, not fully so, but global exchanges are much more integrated. And there's been leaps in technologies. Containerization started before, has become widespread since 1990. Uh, and fiber optics and computer power, and I'll come back to some of these technologies to give a sense of the speed of change. But when you put all these things together, uh, together some of the other trends that I'll point to, urbanization, what we've entered into is a world of very different levels, immensely more connected, connected physically and virtually around the world, in different orders of magnitude of connectivity to previous generations. And this presents a whole new set of policy challenges. It globalizes all the policy challenges, or many of them, uh, but it also means that the things that we have to manage will come from outside our jurisdiction, and that managing uh, highly complex and integrated networks, which is basically what we have to do in this policy environment, is a very different sort of challenge to managing something that we have more or less control over, like a local economy, a local society, a local terrorist threat, or whatever. Um, so we enter into this period of supercharged globalization of connectivity, uh, where what happens in one part of the world instantaneously uh, informs and affects us in another part. That's the downside, and I'll come back to it. But it also has enormous upside potential, because connectivity also means creativity and innovation. And when you connect people who are, many of them, freshly educated, over 300 million people educated for the first time over the last decade. Uh, you connect educated people, uh, you connect ideas, you bring people together in new ways, you leapfrog. And this we know from all our experiences of going back to the Renaissance, the big cities, London, uh, in the past, is what creates new ideas and major steps forward in civilizations when people come together. And we see this in this chart of the relationship between income growth and population growth over the last 2,000 years. And what we see there is about a 1,000 years ago when Islamic and Christian civilizations met each other, um, you had and many other things came together. It was a period of, a micro period of globalization. You had this leap in innovation and income generation. And we, over this last 20 to 30 years, have been through a similar experience with the opening up and integrating of the world. More people connected in new ways than ever before. Ideas, innovation, uh, and this is going to continue as long as globalization and integration continue. So there's a new book out called The End of uh, Innovation or something. I regard that as junk. I think we're just entering a phase of massive innovation created by proximity, both physically and virtually. When people, many of them who haven't connected before, meet each other virtually and physically, when they connect with capital and markets and consumers, innovation flourishes. That has always been the history, and it will, I believe will be. Now, this gives us enormous potential. It enables us to be optimistic despite uh, there are many things to be pessimistic about. Because we can have some confidence that if we can keep up this trend, uh, if we can sustain integration, if we can sustain the markets, if we can keep trade opening up, keep capital markets opening up, uh, we will continue to get 
more rapid economic growth around the world, and more resources to deal with problems as well as more ideas, creative ideas, more genius unleashed in the world to deal with the problems uh, that we face. We need that. We need that like never before because the problems will be much greater, and I'll come back to that. Just many ways to measure uh, connectivity, uh, and I'm not going to spend too long on this because I think it would be obvious to, to you. But there, I'll just flip through a couple of this is financial flows, um, foreign direct investment, remittances, which is what migrants sent home, portfolio investment, bond and equity flows, and ODA, which is aid flows. Very unstable, but the simple point of this graphic is to illustrate that they are of a different order of magnitude uh, to the period before 1990. And whatever you look at in terms of integration flows or flows across borders, you see very similar things. You can look at container traffic, you can look at internet traffic, uh, you can look at the global goods uh, as well as the global bads, and I'll come back to that illicit trade, for example. Uh, so we, we economists, I'm an economist, we create these measures of integration, and these are just two simple ways of reflecting um, connectivity, restrictiveness index, and openness indexes for the rich and poor countries. And again, you see this change and this great connectivity process happening across the <coughs> world. There's other ways to do this. Um, uh, which, uh, this sort of thing, that the blue indicates uh, shipping lanes and shipping connectivity, container traffic. Uh, and the yellow is how many hours people are away from a mega city defined as over five million people. And what you see, so the shades of yellow is under three hours. People coming together uh, very closely and benefiting enormously through this. And these are just another way of looking at it, which is urbanization, which is the relationship between income and urban. Now, it's not that when countries become rich that people <coughs> urbanize. Yes, that happens. But urbanization and economic growth are what the economists call endogenous. Urbanization creates economic growth because of proximity, because people coming together more densely are able to share ideas, innovate, and access the things they need to grow, be it capital, financial markets, goods and services, all the things you need to create a firm, to create a business, to sell your, your, your products come out of the urban area. And so it's no accident that more urbanized societies grow more rapidly, and they will continue to do so uh, as there's more and more urbanization. So this has brought enormous benefit to the world on a scale which has never been seen before in human history. And so it is that over this period of turbocharged globalization, life expectancy on average uh, has increased by about 20 years. Now it took from the Stone Age to the 1980s to achieve that. Uh, illiteracy in the world's gone down from about 50% to about 25%. And the number of people living under a dollar a day, which is just one very crude measure of poverty, and one can look at other measures as well, has gone down by about 300 million, despite the world's population going up by about 2 billion people at this time. This has never happened in history. Historically, as the world's population increased, the number of poor people increased with it. Uh, so this is just quite remarkable given the scale of what's happening here. The question clearly is, where does this go and can it continue and what's the other side of this? The two key dimensions which are the underbelly of this process, and I'm only going to focus uh, on one of them strongly today. The one is global inequality. This process has been associated with increasing inequality between and within countries over this period of time. The between country story is largely driven by the failure of a relatively small number of countries, 40, 50 countries out of the 210, uh, to connect. Their problem is really too little globalization, either because they have leaderships who won't allow their societies, the North Koreans or whatever, to connect, or because they geographically isolate the Sahel, other locations. Um, or corruption, where they, they connect like Angola, but the elites skim everything uh, and the people benefit. Uh, that's, that country is actually growing extremely rapidly. So global inequality, if you take out the failed states and the lowest income uh, countries, there's convergence between countries. And that's obvious because the emerging markets are growing at two, three, four times the rate that we grow in the OECD. And so there's convergence if you take out the failed states um, and the very slow growers. 
And then within countries, there's another story about inequality, which we can come back to the people in the policy exchange and this will be very familiar with. The other policy challenge of globalization, and this is the one I want to spend much more time on because it's the one that's not appreciated, not understood, uh, is that globalization provides connectivity for opportunity, but it also provides connectivity for risk and for systemic risks. And this is the big, big challenge that we face going forward. That the more connected we are, the more our risks transmit. And this is true globally uh, as well as within a country. So as we become more and more a complex network, we need to worry much more <coughs> about the network nodes and the network instability of our system. Uh, and what we've seen in the financial crisis is how quickly and how unexpectedly uh, this can happen. So the nature of risk in its intensity and its scale, in its speed of transmission and its origin is different to previous policy challenges. Uh, and this is really quite fundamental change. Of course, because we're more densely packed and because we're much wealthier, the impact of any one event on a place is also much greater in terms of the value, uh, the number of lives, etc., of that risk. So we, we have a different sort of policy challenge. Let me just park that introduction, which is about globalization and the sorts of things it sets up, to talk about some of the individual mega trends, mainly the population dynamics. Uh, longevity and economic trends, then talk about some of the technological trends, and then come back to some of these systemic risk integration uh, questions. Now, a key element in thinking through the future is obviously demography, uh, how many people and their skill sets. The quite remarkable thing about this is I used to feel that the one thing we knew something about was population dynamics. Uh, it turns out it's just as unstable as everything else looking forward, and just as surprising. And these are the range of the UN's population projections only 40 years out. A range of 4 billion people, um, which is two-thirds of the current population of the planet virtually, with enormous consequences for virtually everything you think about, obviously economics, obviously environment, uh, and everything else. And if you differentiate this by region, you see the, begin to see the reasons for this. But everywhere is below the straight line. Everywhere is a lower trend growth in the future. Now clearly demographic change is based on two factors, longevity and fertility. Um, the, the longevity numbers are rather stable. Uh, they are converging around at least two years per decade uh, additional life expectancy around the world. There are exceptions like Southern Africa. Um, there's a convergence around this but these are likely to be very conservative figures. So already, for example, the insurance industry in the city of London is, has got much higher expectations of how long people will live for uh, over this time. Unfortunately, living and being effective as a citizen is not the same thing, and we'll come back to some of those uh, questions about what are the health and capacity of the elderly as they go through these transitions. The fertility story is much more dramatic. There's just a collapse of fertility around the world. Um, and only Africa will be above replacement level uh, by the mid-century. Now, <coughs> replacement level isn't two, because not everyone uh, that's born reaches reproductive age. It's depending on the society. In the UK, it's about 2.1. Some societies, 2.3. Uh, this poses an enormous challenge, and these numbers are, are conservative. We can come back to the reasons why uh, there's a fertility decline if that interests you. But when you run this through, uh, you get this sort of scenario. You move from what we imagine as being the population pyramids uh, to being uh, population coffins, with all sorts of instability in it, including, as you'll notice on this, uh, gender. Different numbers, very significantly different numbers of people at different cohorts. Women living longer uh, because they is more intelligent and don't do stupid things like drive fast cars into trees and things. Um, but, um, but also, at younger ages, the more sexist the society, when you have less kids, strong bias in favor of men or boys. Uh, so you have major problems in, uh, if, if you're only going to have one child and society incomes, other things are going to reward you for having a boy, then strong, and the technologies allow you strong preferences towards 
right? So you have societies, and you'll see the numbers for, for China, where you have tens of millions more boys uh, than, than girls at these conferences. Now, China's slightly more stable uh, skyscraper sort of structure, but all sorts of uh, detailed peculiarities associated with this. Um, and the US, a much healthier structure. Now, interesting, the UK um, is very much healthier than the Italy or China thing. It's more like the US story, and that's mainly uh, based on assumptions regarding migration. And I'll come back to migration. But with higher fertility rates regarding first, genera in, in, um, first generation migration, if relatively high levels of migration, have much, much healthier population demographics uh, going forward. Also because a lot of the migrants then leave after that later life, and so you have a smaller uh, per, uh, top to your, to your things. And this is the sort of structure you want in a society. We have many more people at the lower ends. What this does, of course, is it fundamentally changes your dependency ratios, and here you see the, the ratios for the UK. Dependency, both young people under the age of 15 and elderly people over 65 is classed as dependency in this the declining number of people under the age of 15, increasing number uh, of people over 65, and 100 would be one dependent uh, to one worker. Uh, in this. So you're moving up towards about 0.7 uh, in this. But not as dramatic, and I haven't brought with the others uh, for some societies, Japan up to 100 uh, over this period, with mainly the age the elderly rather than the young. Every society you can do this for. Very, very important. Um, and what you get over this period is the elderly um, vastly outnumbering the, uh, the youth. This will lead to all sorts of structural shifts. The inequalities of the future, the policy challenge will be generational um, because the elderly will hold on to their assets. They'll hold on to their houses, they'll hold on to their bank accounts, they'll need their savings because they, the society will not be able to sustain them to pay at social security level, pension levels, and so on, in the levels that it has in the past. People, elderly will hold on to their assets, they'll save more, that's obviously a big problem in terms of global imbalances, we can come back to that issue, um, so the global imbalances won't unwind on that basis, and, um, and they'll, they'll, they'll hold political power, of course, so they will push governance towards favoring the elderly. They also hold on to their jobs. One of the things I'm pretty sure will happen is that the discussions we're having now, which seem pretty fraught, um, about retirement ages will seem rather quaint uh, when we look back at them in 10 years' time, uh, even or 15 years' time, when we begin to look at the fiscal uh, and other implications again. And um, one of the ways of dealing with that, of course, is to accelerate uh, the move up in retirement ages, or indeed abolish retirement ages, which is more likely. The, the whole social contract around pensions will also have to change, both public and private, um, in this process. It's just not sustainable when you run these numbers through. It's not sustainable in the UK, and it's not going to be sustainable uh, in other societies. It's certainly not going to be sustainable in China and other places. So people will be encouraged to save more and have to save more. You have one kid, and you save. Uh, that's how you deal with your dependents, rather than having many kids expect that if they're going to go and herd the goats, they're going to look after you. And that's the past. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in this absolute change. So the life expectancy of retirement is very, very different uh, going forward. And um, what, what you see here is that basically 1970 uh, is the yellow and the red is 2004. That people now in the UK can expect to live for approaching um, over 20 years, and actually it's moved forward. The right hand uh, panel is the more recent one. Now this is this is a radical change uh, in the way that people think about work, about education, uh, because you'll be working well into your 80s. This presents people's attitudes from a survey that we did across many different societies towards work taxes, savings, and pensions. And what you see here is it's very varied. Different societies expect um, the state or um, uh, the um, private firm or their own savings to be different. And they have different expectations about retirement age as well. But what you see in this, uh, you look at the UK, is that there's still an expectation that the state is going to basically uh, look after you. Uh, and very different to in some other societies 
in terms of expectations. Yeah. So this will need to change uh, over time uh, in line with people working longer lives and having expectations of a bundle of different uh, opportunities. And why I said this is going to change most rapidly in Asia is because there will be 700 million people uh, over the age of 60 uh, by 2025. Uh, and clearly the societies aren't in a position to sustain it if they will stop working and have an expectation uh, of, the, of the society looking after them. So the burden on the youth has to be reduced over time. Uh, because otherwise the tax levels and the pressure on the youth in all sorts of ways, the frustration of the youth in terms of entering the market is going to become a major policy issue. So I think we'll see a very different attitude uh, towards how long people work for, the sorts of rotation in and out of uh, labor markets, um, and also expectations regarding when you, for example, become a CEO. The world will become much more like Oxford, where you used to be, and so the wait for your problem to be wheeled out uh, of the college before you can get the professor at the point because they hold on to them. Uh, so this is, we'll move from a society where now we expect CEOs to be 40 or something uh, to, I think, rebalancing towards what more like uh, it used to be. So as the workforce uh, in the rich countries, because of this demographic change, goes through a, a drastic, assuming, this, is, this, this graphic is assuming current retirement uh, and entry of work levels. So assuming that there's not radical change in when people enter and leave labor markets, the workforce in the rich countries, uh, OECD countries, goes down from about 800 to about 600 million people over this period. Dramatic decline um, in this, mainly because less and less people uh, come in. And uh, so the question is, can migration make up this potential? Well, it's currently about 20 million migrants coming in to rich country labor markets as migrants. So you need migration levels of, of five times, about 100 million, to begin to compensate. But even that wouldn't address this challenge. So we need to think about very different ways of thinking about labor markets and also thinking about uh, migration. Uh, I think we will find that the current debates that we're having about migration also get surpassed by the economic and other realities. And then when we zoom forward to, say, 2020, it's much more likely uh, that we'll be fighting about how many more migrants we can bring into societies and as opposed to how many we can keep up. Not only skilled, but also um, unskilled, because the elderly are going to be demanding uh, more and more care. They're going to need people to push them around in their wheelchairs to clean them, to feed them. So the big gap, and I'll come back to that, is going to be uh, the difference between our capabilities to have regenerative medicine, which keeps people physically healthy, and the medicine that's going to be able to deal with the neural disease, the neuro diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia, which we have, uh, I think, no, very little hope of will address in this horizon I'm talking about in the next 10, 20 uh, years. So uh, I, I see um, the debate about migration uh, changing quite fundamentally in the medium term. Uh, and also, of course, an appreciation that migrants bring dynamism. Half the patents in the U.S. taken up by migrants, for example. Uh, Silicon Valley, half the startups are migrants. It's that sort of recognition of the connectivity between innovation uh, and dynamism in the economy and migration, I think, will change much of the debate. As well as the sort of failures of trying to keep people out uh, through traditional measures. Uh, let me just move to the uh, economic growth story because the other strong dimension is going to be where are these migrants going to come from and where the market's going to be. Uh, the, this was work I did at the World Bank um, before I left it four years ago and I keep looking and thinking, is that, has this stood the test of time, uh, particularly as there's been a financial crisis uh, since then? And I think the answer is even more so yes. Uh, and the reason is that the emerging markets really digested the lessons of structural adjustment and crisis of the 1980s and the 1990s in ways that we in the rich countries just failed to comprehend, or if we didn't comprehend them, we didn't apply them. Uh, and so the fiscal position uh, and the fundamentals are just much stronger in emerging markets. And that's allowed them to withstand uh, the, this, this storm of the recent years and emerge in a much stronger position. So if anything, 
the anticipated growth rates over the next 10, 20 years of the emerging markets are even more different, differentiated uh, from the, the, the mature rich markets than they were before. And so they will grow at two, three, four times the level that we're growing at uh, over this time uh, on a sustained basis. Now this is, again, I keep saying, this has never happened in history, but this has never happened in history as well. Uh, that a set of countries grow uh, at between 5 and 10 percent over a very long period of time. We've never achieved that in the UK or in Europe. Uh, you double your income every 10 years when you get a 9 percent growth rate. Uh, this is absolutely phenomenal and it's been going on for 20 years and will go on for another uh, 20 years or so. So uh, this, this uh, is going to change the balance of economic power. Uh, India is regarded as a laggard, but India is still growing at well over 5 percent. Uh, it doesn't seem too bad. Um, and clearly the whole weight of economic power uh, moves to Asia. When will China overtake the US just depends on what measure, whether you do PPP uh, or not exchange rates and your assumptions are really to growth. I think it's going to be uh, sooner rather than later. Um, this means that the imperative on the UK and other societies to address these markets, and the Prime Ministers in China today, I understand, is absolutely the thing to do. This is going to be the focus of global power uh, in, in economic terms. And the economic policies taken in these countries are going to matter enormously to us. Let me move very quickly from what some of the economic challenges are to um, the technological challenges and just highlight some of the technologies that are coming down the road which we need to uh, bring into our orbit of policy making. Driving a lot of these is this just constant power of computing, uh, Moore's law being robust over time and indeed the curve getting steeper uh, over time. And this is uh, behind much of the innovation we see and is the sort of phenomena that means that our uh, mobile phones are more powerful than the Apollo space program. You can go down um, and buy a terabyte of information at Dixon's now or any high street store for 80 pounds. I think that was the installed computing capacity in the UK about 50 years ago. Um, so this is what you get uh, when you uh, keep driving this thing at these exponential rates. And when you speak to the computer scientists and engineers in Oxford, they tell you this is robust over at least the next 20 years. So this will continue. Uh, there's all sorts of amazing stuff, including much which I just don't understand, like quantum, um, which is made for people optimistic it's sustainable power increase. What you get with it is many, many different things that will inform society, including the information big bang, and this extraordinary exponential growth uh, in digital memory capacity, that's the blue line, um, as well as digital information being transmitted and stored. Um, and the, these are exponential growths, and every year uh, are far exceeding all the words uh, ever said or written in history, and that's growing, so it's getting more and more fast. So more and more connectivity uh, at higher and higher speed, the question is what do you do with it? How does it help you make policy decisions? What does it mean for a policymaker to have this? Does it make you any more effective as a policymaker? And what do you have to manage in terms of this? Because this in itself uh, is a policy challenge, uh, not least the cyber crime, uh, cyber information problems. So this is clearly a ma one major technological trend which pre presents opportunity as well as challenge. The other one I want to highlight is the miniaturization trend. This is um, a nano needle going through the cell membrane. The time scale on this is 44 billionths of a second and the diameter, the thickness of this membrane is about 4 billionths of a meter. Uh, this is the future of ability to make invisible uh, to the eye objects moving at speeds which are uh, and also invisible to the eye. The, the issue about this um, is enormous upside potential. Uh, for example, we're looking in this particular set of graphics at the potential to deliver cancer drugs to particular individual cells, which will revolutionize 
uh, cancer treatment, but also all sorts of uh, perhaps unintended consequences. And with all of these technologies, we see this problem of unintended consequences and the inability of policymakers, or indeed the scientists themselves, to understand what these might be. And so the worrying thing, as you might have noticed on this particular nano uh, needle, is that it takes a piece of the cell, pieces of the cell with it uh, as it comes out of the other side. So is this a new threat? Is this a new asbestiosis? Should it be regulated? How would you begin to understand that? Should we be allowing, as we can, go down to the local uh, high street pharmacy and you can see products that say with nano uh, in it. Uh, and that's true of many other products as well, window cleanings and other products. Should that be allowed? Should the government be regulating? And how does it begin to understand it? With many of these technologies, and this is certainly true with the financial markets, we're in a world where the technologies are evolving at a pace which it's impossible virtually for a policymaker to um, comprehend what's happening here. Uh, and to understand the diverse advice of the scientists uh, in this respect. So as the technologies become more ubiquitous, more powerful, and we become more connected, the pressure, I think, on policymakers to get up to speed uh, on science is going to become ever greater because the threats posed by science, as well as the opportunities, will be greater. This is another technological marvel. This is an embryonic stem cell, a cardiac cell. Uh, and in our stem cell, uh, the nano, by the way, is from our nano lab in Oxford, and this is from the stem cell lab in the Oxford Martin School. Uh, this is absolutely extraordinary. The potential to be able to uh, direct cells to become any uh, part of the body is something we're on the cusp of, and we are doing work with the FDA in the US on rebuilding <coughs> some of the spinal column uh, that hopefully we walk again, having thought that they'd be quadriplegic for life. The, the upside potential is clear, but what isn't clear is when and how this is going to enter the market, who's going to have access to it, whether it, uh, it'll be patented in different ways, uh, whether it'll be widely available, whether it will increase or decrease inequality in health provision. Um, and of course, the major ethical issues, not least. Uh, in stem cell regarding embryonic research. Uh, so, again, this sort of major breakthrough brings with it enormous potential, but also a whole series of policy challenges going forward. This one uh, is even more demanding of the policy maker. Uh, the mouse in the back is a, is a happy wild mouse, uh, and the mouse in the front is an even happier <laughs> slightly genetically modified uh, mouse. Uh, it's happier because it can reproduce to the age of about 85 uh, equipment. Uh, and it eats more, which we all, I think, like doing. Um, the wild mouse drops out after about 200 meters, and the slightly genetically modified mouse uh, goes for two kilometers, ten times the distance. Uh, so this is clearly at the mouse level. <laughs> um, but it will be, and these sorts of technological revolutions will be becoming available over this horizon of the next decade, which I was asked to speak about, uh, for societies. And the UK, like other societies, are going to have to decide what they think about this, uh, whether this is something we want, who will have access to it, and whether we want uh, to regulate around it or not. Uh, now, we will make those decisions mindful of the fact that everyone else will be in a similar uh, mode. And so this might affect, for example, our competitive advantage in the future. Uh, it might change. Well, now, genetic is only one aspect, uh, and what I've shown you, which is enhancement, physical enhancement, is only one aspect of the story. And clearly this will make the discussions on doping in sport trivial. So um, I don't think the 212, 212 committee needs to worry about it, but 2018, uh, when we get it, hopefully, um, uh, the World Cup, uh, maybe uh, we'll begin to see some of these things playing through. The interesting thing is not only other dimensions of genetics, that we'll be doing genomes by the next decade for a tiny <coughs> fraction of the current cost, so we go down to our local 
GP, uh, quite possibly do a genome, but when the insurance industries get hold of that, uh, what are the implications of that, because it will show what predispositions for life. Does government intervene, how and where? We need to begin to get ready for those debates. And more fundamentally, uh, we need to appreciate that what's happening on physical is also happening on mental and cognitive. So we developing, um, society, scientists are developing a whole series of uh, enhancements which will allow people to, say, concentrate more, uh, shift their IQ distribution slightly. We know this is possible. We've done it with salt already, ionizing salt, which shifts that distribution, particularly at the lower end. Um, and there will be other, there are already other chemicals, and um, I'm sure uh, none of the students you speak to have ever taken them. Um, uh, but already there's all sorts of things that people take. We will take coffee, so we must take coffee to stay awake. Uh, this will become more sophisticated, more widespread, um, and we need to make decisions about whether we think it's a bad or good thing. Now, it does, you know, the instinctive reaction is well, this is a bad thing, uh, let's keep it out. But actually, we could think of all series of good reasons why we want, might want some enhancement. Like, would you want long-distance truck drivers at 3 in the morning to be alert? Like, would you like your fighter jet planets to be more alert? Like, um, would you like to move a set of people who are cognitively completely disabled and can't do most things in society slightly up the distribution curve? Wouldn't that be good for uh, income distribution, for example? let alone for what it would do to the UK's GDP, uh, uh, and so on. So there's all sorts of difficult decisions that as these technologies become more sophisticated and the potential becomes more widespread, we need to understand. But before we do that, we also need to appreciate that there's no medical testing on this. We're not doing the sorts of drug, drug trials, the clinical testing, uh, the random sampling, which you know you need to do in order to ensure that they uh, don't have negative side effects, all sorts of things. So, making this discussion part of what is socially acceptable, uh, beginning to get into a mode where we understand that technology will be revolutionary, that we need to be able to form decisions around it is important. If we don't, we won't be prepared for these very big decisions that are going to face our society coming out of these technologies. These technologies about, uh, which may be a bioethical nightmare, they may reinforce uh, inequalities. If only the rich can be physically or mentally enhanced, or maybe not even the British, maybe the National Health Service will never be up to it in the next 10 years. Maybe people go to some other society which have much more sophisticated or private provision of such services. So the sort of discussions we have now about, uh, as I say, you know, stomach tucks and facelifts, that will be the quaint old past uh, for the policy makers of the 2020s uh, and which will be for. The other thing we need to be aware of now moving back to the globalization risk story is that these things can play through into risk. So this supercharged globalization, this level of integration in the world uh, is also leading to a whole new series of shocks that will come. Typically what we do is we, we survey, we ask people what they think the risks are, uh, we, we measure public opinion and then we try and uh, create some sort of mechanism in response to that. And we, and we also, it's between the insurance industry, do these sorts of risk probability impact analyses. The problem is that the long tail is wagging, that the incidence of um, low probability, very high impact events is increasing. And we can talk about why that is. So what is, what is government, what are policy makers, local policy makers, national, <coughs> do about these low probability events? Now, it's happening because we are more vulnerable because of our connectivity to things coming from outside and because we're more densely packed. So what happens to one person affects us in a way that we wouldn't have uh, in previous generations of risk. So more connectivity means more unexpected shock. Uh, and because we're more densely packed, the impact is much higher. And we, of course, are richer as well than any more of us. Now, uh, we move up in this process from the things I used to worry about, which are on the bottom left quadrant, uh, to the things I now uh, worry about. And that obviously governments have the ultimate responsibility for uh, national policy makers, which is the keeping their citizens alive and well uh, through crises. Uh, in the end, that is the biggest responsibility uh, of governments. The, this is becoming a bigger and bigger policy challenge. 
And we need to <coughs> prepare, I think, societies for the fact that we need to set aside more resources for risk management of this extremely high impact nature. Uh, you'll all be familiar with uh, Lord Rees and his book, Our Final Century, uh, where he puts a 50% probability on civilization not surviving the 21st century. He doesn't say homo sapiens uh, because he thinks there will be pockets of people that around. But what he means is the achievements that we've accumulated will be fundamentally uh, set back. And he has a whole range of things he worries about. <coughs> Let's say, which I do think, although he's an absolutely wonderful man, I think one of the smartest people in Britain, uh, that he's pessimistic. Um, <laughs> and that it's a 5% chance. But even if it's 5%, and I, you know, who knows, that sounds sort of reasonable to me, um, then we need to put a much greater effort than society is and the policy makers are on this issue. Because the, the impact is so enormous, like just we, as we do with fire insurance for our house, or our police services or everything else, these are the things that we really need to set aside significant brain power and resources uh, to manage. And we need to get society behind us. Now, what we have when we have these integrated um, structures and we have increasing homo homogeneity of systems around the world is we have this failure of the global commons. What we know is that rational decisions for an individual fisherman, for example, are irrational <coughs> at the collective level. Um, and we have enormous difficulty dealing with this, particularly when what's rational for an individual country is irrational for countries put together. And what we have uh, behind a lot of this policy is a problem of turbocharged globalization and connectivity and dinosaur <coughs> governance evolution. And you put these two things together and the growing governance gap between the challenges of the 21st century, which are managing globalization to ensure we are able to harvest the benefits and build resilience against the risks on the one hand and our capacity to do it are diverging. And that is the biggest policy challenge uh, of the coming decades. This divergence between um, our capability of harvesting and managing risk. Climate change clearly amongst the different uh, dimensions of this very high up. This is a, 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 a sad story that um, I must bear some responsibility for because I was at the World Bank involved in trying to save uh, the Aral Sea. And you can see that uh, this wasn't a very happy outcome. The different countries in this project were acting rationally. Their policy makers who were trying to feed their people and grow their exports were drawing more and more water. Collectively, of course, it was a disaster. There are good examples. This is obviously the Straits of Gibraltar, and you will be familiar that over the same period as the Aral Sea collapsed, the Mediterranean was saved, uh, which was also really on the verge of collapse in different ways. What are the differences between these? One of these is that there were a lot of democratic governments behind the Mediterranean driving and citizens were demanding action uh, in this in a way that they weren't capable of in the former Soviet Union uh, with the LLC. That is a great source of optimism. The scientists were on top of this in a way that they ignored it in the LLC. So the combination of policy of citizens who are aware, policy makers who realize that they have to respond to their citizens because they're in a democratic context. And scientists who are able to really understand not only the problems but the solutions becomes important. But interestingly about the Mediterranean is of course half the countries surrounding the trade are not democratic. Um, and this was a combination of helping those that weren't to get there. Now can we, with the climate challenge, which is clearly high on our agenda or policy challenges for the coming decades, find uh, solutions? I'm absolutely convinced that this is happening. Anyone that knows the you know, is a climate skeptic or knows one, do put them in touch with me, and I'll put them in touch with the scientists of Oxford who have sort of more than convinced me about the dimensions uh, of this. Now, we know a huge amount about the increases in carbon concentration and what that will do to average temperatures. And because I think we're doing too little today, I'm pessimistic on this. I think we'll be at the high end of these spectrums. But what we don't know much about at all is what that means in terms of actual weather on the ground, 
uh, precipitation, etc., in detail because of the complexities of the system. You know, for our friends from the local authorities, what will it mean for Oxford? Well, maybe I will be able to barbecue in the summer in my shorts. Uh, that would be nice. Uh, but more rain, when, how, water tables, uh, crops, we don't have that level of granularity yet. But we do know that one of the policy challenges is going to be radically reduce your carbon emissions. Bring them down. They've got to come down to about two tons of carbon per capita as quickly uh, as possible. And we are around 10. Uh, pretty stable growing. Uh, this recession came down a bit, uh, but now pretty stable. How do we do it? Uh, and how do we ensure not only that we do it, but that particularly others do it, and allow developing countries their right to develop their energy, their transport systems, and this. We've filled up the atmosphere with carbon over the last 150 years. We cannot say to other nations, no, sorry, it's full, stop development, uh, no energy, no transport. We have to find ways that can allow us to happen everywhere. Technology is going to have to be a major part of the solution. We have developed this, uh, vehicles, as others have in Oxford, we've done this, but it's been done elsewhere as well, uh, that can do, for example, 5,000 miles per gallon. It's not actually so much a scaling and technological problem, though you can see with this picture with my son inside of this is a scaling issue. Uh, but the technology is the least of the problems. The vehicles exist already, the hybrid vehicles, the systems exist. It's a question of mass behavior change mass incentive change at a speed which allows quick enough, scale enough shifting around the world. That's the policy challenge. It's enormous. We also need to think deeply about some of the mitigation and offset potentials. Geoengineering is going to be a big policy challenge for governments going forward. Uh, the scientists are looking at a whole series of options to reduce carbon in the atmosphere. This is one of them. This is bringing alive parts of the ocean which are currently dead uh, by putting iron filings into them. And what you see here is a dump off the back of a ship uh, to, of iron filings leading to plankton blooms in, in this area. The oceans absorb about 40% of carbon. If you could increase it slightly, you would reduce the pace at which climate change is happening, perhaps. But we need to understand the unintended consequences. In this case, for example, the plankton die on the surface and the carbon goes back into the atmosphere. So it's not very effective, and you've probably broken the law by dumping at sea, um, and uh, you make, might be making the oceans uh, more acidic in the process. So what we're trying to build is integrated, strong programs. And we need a program of Manhattan Project type of scale to work out how to deal with it. We need to lift the urgency and bring the scientific uh, and other communities together with the politicians, with the lawyers, with the, the, the finance people. What is ethical? What is the right thing to do? I don't believe that geoengineering is going to be a solution, but I believe there will be people out there trying it. And we need to be ready for that from a regulatory and other point of view to stop sort of wild west in people's responses and try and get some coordination. Let me just shift from one uh, thing which has come about as a result of turbocharged globalization acceleration of climate change that we have to mitigate to another, uh, which I think is going to be an even bigger challenge, which is um, one that the UK, of course, has faced in the past when it killed 30 to 50 percent of their population, as this plaque uh, uh, shows in Liverpool. Uh, what we need to recognize that we've been incredibly lucky. Pandemics have always been the biggest killers. Uh, I would never guess at speaking to my school age kids who are in great schools in Oxford who spend most of their time studying wars. Um, but it's basically a story which has driven uh, a lot of humanity's history. It will, I'm afraid, be the primary one policy challenge going forward as well for many societies. How do you build resilience against super spreading pandemics? This is work that we did from our Institute of Emerging Infections in the Oxford Martin School with government on thinking about tiny flu distribution strategies. Clearly this is part of it. What do you stop? When do you stop? How do you distribute? Who should get it if you don't have enough? What are the ethics? What, what's the distribution logistics? These are important policy questions. One needs the preparedness for them. But one also needs to recognize that the nature of the threat is going to change fundamentally. Although there's this continuity over time, the new technologies are alarming. And particularly we need to worry, I think, about things like what is the unintended consequences of wonderful 
progress in, for example, DNA synthesizing, which allows people to concoct with for in decreasing amounts of money, because this is falling exponentially with computing power, its growth, uh, new sequences of, say, smallpox, Ebola, and other extremely nasty and brutal things. The threat is moving from being organized, global, identifiable nations or mass organizations like the Mafia uh, to pockets, even single individuals of people. And these need not, although they could be religiously based, but they might be uh, Armageddon based, like the Waco Texas sort of uh, Armageddon based. Or they might just be crazies. And so the problem as we move into this very tightly interwoven global village is what do we do about the village idiots with wonderful technologically enhanced weaponry? Uh, how do we begin to make sure that we benefit from these technologies? We can't stop them, but we don't allow them to bring our societies down. I'm much less worried about the policy challenge, although clearly it will continue to be there, that arises from machetes from other old sources of conflict. Uh, this will continue. And there are obviously major policy threats, uh, and you don't have to uh, read very far to worry about, for example, Israel and Iran and other countries. But I think that this is a much more stable an understandable environment than the new policy environment that we're heading to, that we're much more prepared to deal with what are the old threats. And we've been remarkably successful, knock on wood, um, with, for example, holding the nuclear threat down over the last 60 years. But it's this new type of policy threat, the new type of terrorism, the new type of unintended consequences, as well as accidents. Some of the biggest threats in bio have come out of accidents in Australia and elsewhere in recent years. Unintended consequences. And we need to, uh, to build an appreciation that because we are so intertwined, because uh, globalization is the driving force going forward, uh, the nodes are particularly worrying points. The nodes in transport, shipping, the nodes in computer, the nodes in financial networks, the ports, the harbors, the places, the power grid nodes. And we see this bizarre return to piracy in the 21st century, where individuals armed with a combination of ultra new, like satellite, uh, uh, other technologies, and some very primitive technologies, are able to choke uh, globalization. We will see this in many sectors. And the policy challenge is where do you go with this interdependent set uh, of challenges? And how do you combine a deep-rooted belief in the importance of democracy, civil liberties, privacy, with societies where any individual uh, has a potentially destabilizing threat? And how do you ensure that the global governance challenge uh, catches up, that we somehow give to the global institutions the same dynamism that globalization has brought uh, to the private sector uh, and to many other sectors. How do we make sure that we don't just do what we've always done in the post-war period, which is create institutions in response to crisis, then let them get old and redundant uh, while we wait for the next crisis to come along? Uh, a lot of the discussion that we see, I feel uh, personally, is a bit like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. That we really, uh, of course it matters, who has how many votes on the IMF board uh, or the World Bank board? And I've been engaged in those discussions myself. But it's not going to change the nature of financial risk management in a fundamental way uh, in the coming decades. We really need to uh, get to the I think we need to learn the lessons of the financial crisis in this respect. What, what we found in the financial crisis, we developed um, a very robust global financial system based on the belief that was highly distributed, based on the belief that this complex system allowed us to be resilient in the parts. And what it turned out to be is that they, all these parts were exactly the same, and so we had this domino effect, and that one piece of the system coming down uh, created major problems. And we nearly went to meltdown uh, in terms of the financial system uh, on that famous day after Lehman's. So we are more fragile and more robust at the same time. And we need to be able to manage 
this dual in our minds and in our policy. How do you distribute, have multiplicity of different actors that are highly connected without allowing the collapse of one actor to lead to the collapse of the system? We need to appreciate that there are these global governance gaps and local governance gaps within the structures, within funds, and that these will continue. We cannot, I think, anticipate where the next crises will come from. So we need to understand that the system will become increasingly fractile and we need to build up a resilience in the process to any piece of the system uh, coming down, as well as trying to develop a comprehension of what's going on. We particularly in policy making, and I'm thinking now of the FSA and uh, the regulators in other areas, uh, but health regulation and other, we need to appreciate the pace of technological change. Uh, if the policy makers aren't on top of the technologies, and this isn't only public policy makers, it's also private policy makers. I've sat on the risk committees of bank and set risk policy for banks. And I know that I didn't really understand what was going on in terms of the trading instruments uh, within these institutions. So how do we do it? And how do you take people, um, say in the FSA or in any regulator, and it's absolutely you know, it's amongst the best, uh, and get them to understand the nitty gritty of what these physics and maths graduates from great universities are developing uh, and basically doing regulatory arbitrage. Things which are perfectly legal but designed to operate around the system. Um, how do you control that sort of innovation, uh, creative innovation, which creates value at the time, but can uh, be completely blindsided to the regulators? Do you bring the innovators into the regulator? Do you ban innovation? I don't think that's the right response. But clearly getting up to speed with innovation and constantly renewing while managing the conflicts of interest that arise is absolutely vital because conflicts of interest will arise. If people from the market go into a regulator, they get information, they get inside information, which they then take back into the market, a very risky environment. So we need to think through some of these conflicts of interest and what can. Uh, I think we need to appreciate that management theory has made the system both more robust and more fragile. Just in time, highly fragmented supply chains which distribute supplies from across the economy, from across the world, the reduction in stocks, because st we sweat our assets, reduces resilience. Whether you're a public institution, a hospital, reducing the number of oxygen bottles you have. Whether you're a private uh, institution, and the Cowley auto plant, reducing your stocks because they're being supplied from around the world all the time. That is probably good finance. Your balance sheet improves. Uh, but, and the same is true of a bank, if you reduce your capital, leverage it, which is what the market is telling you to do. But of course, it increases your level of fragility against a shock. Uh, and so we need to begin to think about resilience as an asset to be prized, as a value on the positive side of our balance sheet, within the public and the private sector. Building resilience is going to require a rethinking of how we price and uh, set aside for risk. And finally, we need to appreciate that we cannot do this alone um, in one society. It doesn't matter what we do as policy makers in many areas in the UK. Because of this complexity and integration, we need to ensure that we coordinate with others. Now, the biggest risk of all is that the public perceive in the UK or in other societies, or in all of them, that globalization is bringing too much risk. And what we want to basically do is deglobalize. Protectionism, xenophobia, put up the walls. Put up the economic walls, put up the other walls, and try and keep the bands of globalization out. That would be the biggest disaster. That would lead to a downward spiral uh, where we would get into protectionist wars, where we would find that we don't have, that the economy contracts, and we have less and less resources to deal with problems that will still arise. Because the most of the problems we've talked about will not be generated in the UK necessarily. They'll come from across our borders and certainly be very difficult to control by, say, closing the border uh, or closing the financial market. So we need to appreciate that the stakes are extremely high in this. Policy makers need to ride the wave of globalization. They have to. They need to do this in a much more sophisticated way because the danger of falling off 
uh, is very high. And they need to be able to demonstrate to themselves uh, and to the public that this is the only way of to ride, that the option of, of closing down, of stopping integration, of sealing yourself off, is going to lead to worse outcomes. So the outcomes are far from clear. We don't really know uh, how this increasing complexity uh, increasing vulnerability is going to be managed. We do know that the upside potential uh, is there. We do know that by being integrated, by being a hub in all of this, we are creating an innovative uh, dynamic potential for the future uh, of the UK. So the risk has to be that we need to, that we need to manage the risk of increased coordination. We need to also realize this global village uh, story much more, I think, strongly. We need to appreciate that we really have to come to common management, that there's this increasing disconnect. The world is more and more connected. What affects us will become more and more connected, that unless we catch up with that in terms of global governance, we're not going to be able to stand up and run uh, in the way that we should. We also need to appreciate that these systems that we've created are not necessarily making us wiser they're making us more able to submit information. So how do we drink from the fire hydrant of information? For policy makers, this is often the toughest question. And for groups like Policy Exchange, this is absolutely key. How do you distill this cacophony and growing cacophony uh, of sound to try and get sensible policy out of it, to distill the wisdom is absolutely key. If we can do that, um, we're going to create a wonderful society for ourselves uh, and those around us. Thank you. So in some ways, you might say, uh, perhaps we worry too much about the things which might go wrong. Um, but it seems to me that the core of what you were saying was that in some areas, globalization hasn't gone far enough, fundamentally, in the area of governance. And you, you sort of left that question hanging in the air. Well, there's a problem here. I, I wonder if you've got any views on how we can improve global governance. Have you been in it? <laughs> Yeah, well, having hit my uh, head against, can you, you can all hear me, I don't need the mic, right? I guess yeah, that's yeah, just for the video. Yeah. Um, having hit my head against the wall of, <laughs> of global governance reform for too long, uh, and not having ended up any wiser for it, um, I think that's the most difficult question. Uh, I'm not optimistic about the, uh, the potential for reform of the very big institutions. I mean, marginal reform, yes, it, you know, it has to happen. But if you say, assuming for a minute that the sorts of issues that I put on the table are the right issues for global governance to worry about, amongst others, uh, then you have to say, well, are they going to deal? Are those the right institutions to deal with these sorts of questions? Uh, and as I, I think that's far from clear. One of the challenges facing these institutions is mission people all over the place, uh, uh, and so they become less effective. What their core competence is uh, in many areas. So then you say, well, do you create a new institution? Uh, is that the answer? And um, there I'm sort of filled with horror uh, as well, because I know that institutions are very easily created, very easily captured. Um, and they say, well, they, you, you know, <laughs> you talk about global governance, you don't want the institution, don't want the existing institution, what's the solution? I think, I think part of the solution is um, we have to think of new ways of managing through, not necessarily global, but um, mandated. What am I thinking? So take an issue like climate change. We know that about 15 countries account for 95% of global carbon emissions. And we also know that we could think of a representative sample of about 15 or 20 countries that display all the sorts of likely impacts uh, that are likely to occur. Now obviously some, there's a big overlap. We 
because, for example, the U.S. would be both in the bitter and the impact uh, in terms of economic. But you might want the Maldives or Bangladesh in your impact societies as well, but you wouldn't have them in your bitter society. Now, are we prepared to say to them, you will go, lock yourselves in a room, uh, you know, maybe we'll give you some enhancement uh, and lots of champagne when you come out, and we prepare to really give you a lot of uh, social capital, political capital, to come up with a solution that's rational for us. And you know, for the UK that might mean you delegate to another country, or it might not, I don't know what the answer to that, that question is. And what we found in the IMF, just the, you know, the Europeans can't even delegate the IMF seat. Uh, uh, so I think we have to, I think we have to accept that part of global, the global story has to be the willingness to give up some power and sovereignty. Is that politically, you know, I'm a politician, <laughs> I don't know if that's politically possible. Uh, you have to be able to sell to your electorate that this deal is not perfect for your society, there are compromises, but it's a lot better than no deal at all for society and for the future, your future and for your children's future and for the world's future. That's one, one way I think to do it. The other way is to say, well, there's some things that work very well. You know, I travel too much, so I'm really glad that, uh, that international air traffic control works really well. Um, it's the nice uh, and, and there's some other areas that seem to work. You know, postal service works well, meteorology works well. There are some global systems that work pretty well. Um, why? Is it because they're very narrow, standards focused? Uh, what can you learn from that? Um, are there things that could be managed by societies? Maybe. I mean, if you want to abolish child labor in the world, would you create an organization or you sponsor a lot of NGOs that go and put on Facebook and everywhere else all the child labor factories? Yeah. Um, and which will have a bigger impact on achieving your health? So I think we need to think of, of new ways of, of telling these, thinking about some of these global challenges. We need to harness the power of, of social media. We need to harness, I think, our newfound solidarity. I was amazed that within a week of the Haiti uh, earthquake, that people from over 100 countries gave uh, money to Haiti. What did that tell me? It told me, A, that there was technology, e-giving, and so on to do it. But it also told me that there's a common awareness around the world from the most remarkable diverse set of countries who I wouldn't have previously associated with any cares at all about Haiti. And I think that's what global consciousness, social networking, and other things is also doing. I think we feel more connected as a global community than ever before. And I think a lot of people, particularly youth, are willing to give more uh, to it in terms of political capital and even money uh, to it. And I think that's not being harnessed uh, for global problem solving in the way it's done. So no, no, I think there's lots of different things that we can think about. Okay. So maybe in the front of it. Hi. Um, my name is Kathy, and um, I'm covering the
There are also things which, which, which I think we need to really learn much more. Uh, the insurance industry, for example, is a very interesting industry because it's basically picking up the can of the stuff uh, or, or going bankrupt in the process. And we have a mutual interest in insuring its survival. But we also push it to do some things which maybe it shouldn't do. Insuring houses in flood prone areas, for example, uh, increases the risk to society and sends completely the wrong price signals to people who have been purchasing houses. But governments force the insurance industry to flatten, I don't know what happens in the UK, but I know that this happens in Florida, for example, in Louisiana, to flatten rates across the country for distribution and other reasons. If you want to distribute money, distribute money in a way that's targeted at distribution, but don't do it through distorting your housing market, your planning markets, and everything else to make people take on more risky behavior than they should. Um, so there's a lot of discussions that need to happen with industry groups, and I'll just throw out one there, but there are many others, with drug manufacturers, with many others, which would send much better signals to societies actually what the problem is going to be, and how they should personally respond to it without any governments having anything to do with it. Um, in fact, governments getting out might help in that case. So uh, I, I think there's a whole range of partnerships which could deliver a lot more in terms of harnessing the upside and, and <coughs> reducing the, the downside. There were two questions at the back. There's a gentleman at the back left and a gentleman at the very back row. And we'll come to uh, David Greenfield, IESC, uh, policy advisor and uh, climate change and responsibility as well. You mentioned uh, something very interesting about uh, a rational local decision becoming an irrational uh, larger scale decision at a macro scale. Where do we draw the line? Uh, where is the macro scale? And I think it relates very much to the, the, the big society that's already been mentioned in England. Is the macro scale England? Is the macro scale Europe? Does it go world? Um, and then, secondly, about on, on the same issue, the time lag between decision making. Everything that you put up today is exceptionally interesting and very, very potential. How can we integrate that into policy setting? Yeah. So, um, I think just starting with your, your second question, I think there's a big problem. Uh, in talking about risks we don't know when they will happen. We don't know what the impact's going to be. We don't actually, they might never happen. Hopefully they'll never happen. <laughs> and yet we want government to set aside resources, uh, more resources uh, for this. This is a problem, particularly in democracies. Um, and uh, it's one that worries me a lot. Now obviously civil servants have a role to play because civil servants are meant to span governments, uh, and their role is meant to be looking after the medium term as well. Uh, but we know that they're being pushed, uh, particularly when budgets are tight, uh, to less and less long term. Um, and I think this is a, really a case really rare where either it's going to happen because of a crisis, crisis happen, and people say, why weren't you prepared, government? Didn't you know there'd be another pandemic? Didn't you know? That, uh, like it's going to get funded or whatever. Um, and then the politicians lose power, but you know, they were going to lose maybe on something else. Uh, and then, so it, it happens in retrospect, it happens in response to last year's crisis uh, at the electoral poll. But we need, I think, to do a much better job of educating uh, society that we need to set aside resources for risk management. You know, we need the, uh, we, we've done it, but with huge lags. Right? So we set aside in the UK, a you know, significant part of my taxation goes to military expenditure. <coughs> um, but is that, the, is that the right share relative to the risks facing me in Britain? Do I feel it's the right share? No. What is the right share? Don't ask me. I haven't done that. You know. Someone needs to put this out in the open and give people a better sense of the distribution of risk, we're not, you know, we're obviously responding to the Cold War risk, you know, but that's not the next war. And um, I think as societies become wealthier over time, and we're going through a bit of a rough period in England, so we're not feeling wealthier, but we all are becoming wealthier. We need to accept that it's a bigger share of national attention and national uh, resources needs to go into smoothing the cycle and risk resilience. 
Otherwise, we're going to grow up and go down like that. And so we, it needs to be a trade-off, basically, short-term and medium-term, in our allocation of attention and resources. It will happen. The question is when it happens. Is it going to happen? Um, and, and is any government brave enough to really say it's going to happen now? Uh, the, the, the other question of what is local and what is not, um, and where do these things happen? I think it depends very much on the issue. And most things, the answer is uh, yes to all three. <coughs> Local, national, local, climate change. Yes, actions are local. You are providing incentives for people to reduce the carbon emissions in their homes or the public transport systems in the towns or whatever you're doing is local. Um, it's a global deal that's going to set the carbon price to make that more sensible, for example. Now, going towards the end, so if we can yeah. take a couple of questions together, so if we can take you, sir, at the very back there, and then back to the ground there, and maybe we'll have a uh, just wondering, you touched on it in your last um, answer, but to what extent do you think that free and democratic societies are you know, ill-equipped to deal with these new systemic threats? You mentioned air traffic control, and obviously that's a very, very tightly controlled world with no deviation from lanes and air security <laughs> regulation and personnel. Um, to what extent do you think free societies will be able to protect themselves in this new world that you describe? Yes, I'm, I'm Sebastian Payne, a postgraduate at City University. And in your presentation, you mentioned about Moore's Law and quantum computing being this thing that's going to drive us forward. Now, from my personal research, I'm not sure that quantum computing is going to be that. And we've really pushed the boundaries of Moore's Law in the past few years. Now, it's sort of an age old question. If we don't get that technological advancement at the rate we've seen, how is that going to affect our progression? Yeah. Interesting. What's the third question? Sure. <laughs> I was just going to ask um, more technical question here. Um, we talked about various trends and challenges on the horizon from economic to environment and technology. What, what crises potentially you might see in the next decade politically when, you know, in America they just had a question about some of the things. Um, the balance of power between China, obviously, that's completely on the side of the spectrum, and whether you see as we've seen historically, societies reacting to the economic crisis, whether by extreme political movement, whether you, whether you see that as a sort of potential crisis. Yeah. Um, so you've got democracy, quantum computing, yeah, yeah. and political crisis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you've got uh, five minutes. <laughs> 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 so long. <laughs> um, I, I, the democracy question, as I mentioned, does probably, because uh, I'm such a strong believer in democracy. And so but I, I, when you look forward, you worry. Um, it's, it's certainly the case that I can have a much better conversation about the medium term uh, with the Chinese leadership than I'm going to define anyone else more than the Chinese top civil servant. And that there's likely to be a translation of that conversation into something that they can do. Uh, but is, is the society itself sustainable? Uh, I think so. But clearly, we need to look more rapidly. I think. The answer on the democracy front is we need to, that, that leaders need to lead uh, in, in creating a space to discuss in the medium term and long term. We're all going to live the rest of our lives, hopefully, in the medium to long term. Our kids are the next generation. We care about the nature of the planet. Um, and yet the conversation too often is about you know, what we're doing tomorrow today. Um, and, and I think, I, you know, I, I'm not a politician, so I don't know how one does this, but my sense is that, particularly as you move into highly educated societies like the UK, it shouldn't be beyond uh, the voters' wit to realize that actually the medium term matters longer than the short term, right? or more than the short term, and this we get the medium term. If there are things we have to do about the medium term, we'll set aside for the medium term. We've done it with roads, we've done it with infrastructure, that's what societies are boys, and that's how they get their competitive advantage, and that's how they keep it. Uh, if you want to spend it in the short run, all you do is you run and you uh, So I think that that has to be part of the debate. But uh, I add a little bit about democracy, which is if you ask someone in the 1990s, they'd have sort of assumed that China would probably automatically democratize, they got richer, and that that really yeah. was the end of history looked like us, not them, and they weren't really yeah. a competing model, they were a yeah. different model. That seems to be a sort of strong change. Yeah, that's changed. Uh, I think that's, uh, I mean, we're not talking, of, we're talking about the next couple of decades, and I think it's sustainable over, over that time. Um, 
but uh, you know what 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 democracy is responding to is crisis, and that's uh, in a in a very short term way. Uh, and that that really we don't want to do the medium term thing. We have to. You know, there's also an important point about different levels of democracy. Maybe that you know the short term and the, happens at the national policy debate, and actually the long term is not that more local. Just on the question of does crisis lead to extremism in, um, in politics, I, uh, you know, I don't think so. There's really only, as far as I can see, two extremes in the world at the moment. There's North Korea extreme status and there's the Tea Party extreme market. Um, um, and most of the rest of the world is shades of gray in between. You know, everyone recognizes, apart from the Tea Party, that you need a strong government and you need significant taxes and other things to deliver uh, the challenge of society. And everyone except, I think, the North Koreans realize that government is not going to deliver 90% of what society needs. Um, so it's really a, about this balance and weight and emphasis around that. And, and I, I don't think that the crisis in the UK or the crisis uh, in Greece, for example, crisis in many other places led to extremist responses. Uh, on the contrary, I think people are actually more slightly more mature through the process. Um, the, the question of, of quantum, well, you know, you're speaking to an economist, you're a quantum physicist, what can I say? Other than whenever I speak, I, I thought that, I thought it was running out of steam, so did Moore, by the way, in the 1960s. He thought his law would only last for three generations, uh, it would be redundant by 1970. Um, when I speak to the people, they're extremely optimistic. I know that quantum, they've got 200 quantum uh, computer scientists and others in Oxford now, I know that that only they understand it, really, maybe you understand it. Uh, that, that's the much longer term, there will only be certain computer applications. Uh, but I also know that when you ask the question to people in the field, are you, the horizon I'm talking about in the next 20 years, confident that this will continue? There's a whole series of things, optical, parallel, lots of other uh, things which are in the shorter term than quantum that people feel uh, very confident. Much more worry around uh, what the cyber, you know, what you do with it, whether that's sustainable, uh, and the energy consumption. That is a very big issue. And so it's, it's not really a question of whether, it's about whether you can make it more energy efficient. Uh, that, that's the issue for the next 20 years. Well, it's Google, certain yeah. bombs are all yeah. sites next to hydro, and they're so energy yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, we've covered an incredible um, array of different subjects. We are exactly about to run out of time. Um, Thank all of you for your brilliant questions. You've got this got a diverse range of expertise yourself. Um, but most of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Golden, reviewer of presentation. Fascinating stuff, a lot for us to think about. Cheers. Yes.